welcome to another online service. We are so glad that you decided to join us this morning, and we pray and hope that this service is a blessed one. Last week, Brian did a sermon entitled Inner Peace. He asked us the question, do we have inner peace or inner joy? He asked us to look at our daily lives and see if we live in a life that is full of moaning and groaning. He reminded us that the only way to get true inner peace or inner joy was to let go of ourselves. To not let our world or our circumstances dictate our inner peace, or our inner joy, but to rather let God be that true inner peace and inner joy for each of us. Today's service, Ian will be doing a sermon entitled, None Other Than God. We will be led in worship by Andrew and Carrie, and Daddy will be playing the organ for our hymns. Lawrence will be doing the readings. We will also be sharing in communion today. So if you haven't got your elements ready, Please pause now and go do that. Let's open in prayer. Father God, we thank you for another week. We thank you for the grace that you have shown us this week. We pray that through these difficult times that we may find our inner peace and inner joy in you, that we may act in love towards others. We bring all our hurt, anger, needs and pride before you now and ask that you will change our hearts to be more like you. Lead us to the cross, where your love poured out, so that we may be filled with your love too. Sing His praises forever. Oh, we love 
taken from Numbers 21 verses 4 to 9. The snake made of bronze. The Israelites left Mount Hall by the road that leads to the Gulf of Aquaba in order to go around the territory of Edom. But on the way the people lost their patience and spoke against God and Moses. They complained, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert where there is no food or water? We can't stand any more of this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many of the Israelites were bitten and died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Now pray to the Lord to take these snakes away. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a metal stand and put it on a pole, so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake and be healed. Our second reading this morning is taken from John 3 verses 14 to 21. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Saviour. Whoever believes in the Son is not judged, but whoever does not believe has already been judged, because he has not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. Anyone who does evil things hates the light and does evil and will not come into the light, because he does not want his evil deeds to be shown up. But whoever does what is true comes to the light in order that the light may show that what he did was in obedience to God. Good morning, friends. It is a joy and a privilege for me to be able to join in worship with you this morning. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church, the sanctuary and uh, in Edenvale. And may you really know God's presence with you uh, wherever it is that you are worshiping this morning. For it doesn't matter um, whether we are in the sanctuary of the church or whether we are at home or under a tree. God is there, and we can worship God uh, in those times. Uh, for what is important is that our hearts are right before God. I want to open up uh, this morning with the question, what are we chasing in our life? What movements, organizations, ideals, or people do we look to for hope for a better South Africa, a better society, a better life? The gospel passage we read today is a familiar one to, to many Christians. It is one I know I have referred to, turned to, and preached on countless times. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 This proclamation comes in response to a Jewish man, a man of the Pharisees, a leader, um, named Nicodemus, who recognizes something in Jesus and comes to Jesus wanting to, to hear more. They enter into conversation about this idea of being born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. This new birth is one which is not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth, Jesus explains. In explaining how one enters this new birth into a new life, Jesus uses a peculiar phrase, a quote from the Old Testament, which would have been familiar to Nicodemus and possibly others listening in. It is this, And as G Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
Numbers 21 is the reference to this quote of Jesus. And it is significant for the point which Jesus makes in the preceding proclamation, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And I would like us to pause and re reflect upon this aspect of the passage for today. The quote comes from a story which occurs early on in Israel's history and formation as a people of God, the community of faith. And it has been included in the lectionary readings during this Lenten season because of its obvious reference to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. But we must remember that though we have this, the, the perspective of hindsight, Nicodemus and the others did not have the same perspective. The Old Testament passage would provide some meaning to the effect of what Jesus was proclaiming and its meaning for Nicodemus and then for us, especially when Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And they could have brought this moment to mind and to memory. Just to give some background, the book of Numbers recounts part of Israel's history in their journey in the wilderness, a period between leaving Egypt and entering the Promised Land. In this wilderness journey, they encounter numerous challenges, obstacles, and opposition. One of the challenges or obstacles they experience is a lack of food and water resources. And in our current narrative, the people complain about this situation and verbalize the thought that it was better in the old days. Why did we have to come out of Egypt? And did we just come here to die? Their complaining is sinful in the perspective of their relationship with God, who was the one who brought them out of Egypt, as this shows a distrust, a lack of trust. The dynamic of the narrative follows a pattern of sinful behavior. They complain against God, then which moves to a divine negative response. God sends snakes, according to the account that is given in Numbers. Then it moves, there is repentance and a cry of intervention, where the people recognize that they've sinned, they repent and ask Moses to intercede for them. And finally, it ends with divine restoration. God instructs Moses to make a bronze serpent and lift it up on a pole. Whoever gazes upon that um, after being bitten by a snake, they will live. Now, whether we hold to the notion that God caused the snakes to attack the people or that nature did what nature does and the people interpreted it as God punishing them can be debated. Either way, God makes a way for the people who are bitten to continue living, to be healed. It is this repentance and the divine restoration which is particularly relevant uh, to Jesus' use of this narrative for us in this, our journey through the Lenten season. The physical gift of healing in Numbers is transformed into the spiritual gift of salvation in John. Soul healing, new birth, restored life, eternal life. Looking at the serpent is transformed into believing in, that is looking to, trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life, John uh, recounts. There may be some other interesting correlations we could find here. Uh, for instance, the snake could be related to, to sin, uh, as in the beginning when the serpent manipulated Adam and Eve. The idea that we are all bitten by sin uh, and require healing could be something we could look at. As the Israelites look at the serpent and are healed, so we look to the cross where Christ was hung and we are healed of our sin. But we can only go so far with the likening, for Christ is certainly not likening himself to a serpent. But be that as it may, and these number of, of ways we can uh, look at, at the meaning and, and, and what it may we represent. When viewing this passage as part of the Hebrew Bible tradition as a whole, a second vantage point emerges, which is striking for me and something upon which I want us to dwell. The bronze serpent is referenced again later in the Old Testament in 2 Kings 18 verse 4, which tells us that the king Hezekiah broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. 
That too has a parallel in the book of Exodus, where the people complain that Moses has been gone too long on Mount Sinai, where he was receiving the Torah, and they asked Aaron to make gods for them whom they can attribute worship for saving them from slavery in Egypt. They then construct a golden calf. And when Moses returns from the mountain and sees what is happening, he is outraged and destroys the image of the calf. And this is widely read as a polemic against the golden calves of the northern kingdoms in 1 Kings 12, verse 28 to 30. But So what emerges out of these narratives is the idea that any human created thing, regardless of its origin, can become an idol for the community of faith. It does not matter what the idol is made of or whether the original intention of the created thing was good, pure, or even salvific. Those things in our lives that represent God's saving action in human history can all too often replace God instead. From this vantage point, Numbers 21 challenges us to consider what our idols are. What are the things we look to chase, pursue for fulfillment, for healing, for perhaps salvation? What things do we lift above Jesus in our life and faith? One question which emerges out of our last year of the pandemic and having to navigate virtual meetings is have we elevated in-person worship, the church building or the sanctuary into an idol? like the bronze serpent that saved the Hebrews if they could look, but look at it. What about specific traditions in the life of the church? I have to be careful of my identity as a minister, that it does not become an idol, the be-all and end-all of my faith and life. What about the other things that started life as an expression of faithfulness but became the be-all and end-all of that faith? Perhaps it is a ministry which has great values and directions. Perhaps it is a person who has contributed significantly to our faith. What happens if those things disappear or become corrupt? And I think of the recent example of Ravi Zacharias and a comment made on one video which I watched. A person expressed that their faith is crushed because of the fall of Ravi and they were questioning their faith, the very fabric of what their faith means and their life. And someone replied saying that Ravi didn't save them and nor should he be the foundation for our faith. It is Jesus we look to, Jesus who is the foundation, the author and perfecter of our faith. What about an occupation, a business or even a non-profit which starts with good motives and values? And I think of a conversation I had with someone uh, working for a practice in the health profession. When they started their employment, they were excited and hopeful with the altruistic and caring values of that practice. They are currently disappointed and ready to leave because something has changed and it no longer fulfills the hope that one, it once projected for a fulfilling work environment. Perhaps it could be even a stance on such theological points as predestination, the Bible as the literal word of God uh, or revelation of the word of God, the role of women and men in the church leadership, or which, which religious days in the year ob are observed that become an idol. Perhaps it may be a political party or a movement that starts out with good intentions, good motives, but may end up somewhere different. Do those become an idol? This larger canonical context of Numbers 21, together with the passages of the Exodus 32, the Golden Calf, 1 Kings 12, and 2 Kings 18, reminds us how easily our ideals become our idols and eventually leave us unfulfilled and lost. Together with the passage from John, it challenges us to be ever vigilant about our primary commitment to the risen Savior and our secondary commitments 
to everything else. None other than God and Jesus Christ will fulfill, satisfy, give life, and life to the full. John reminds us, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And that eternal life is not some futuristic hope. It is a present reality. The kingdom of God breaking into our reality. And it is life with Jesus. And so friends, as you consider what is it in your life that may take the place and be above Jesus and allow us to, to put those things in the correct perspective and to elevate Jesus to the place of the foundation, the perfecter of our faith and what it is to have hope in this life. And so would you pray with me? Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Healer, our Redeemer, the one in whom we have life. Help us to, to see and to look to you at all times and in every circumstance that you may reveal when our hearts get led astray to other things and make those idols. And help us to ever keep our eyes ever set upon you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
those who are ill, and we ask that you would be with them to give them hope and strength. We pray for their families, that you would help them as they struggle to watch their loved ones who are ill. We pray for those who are struggling financially, Lord. We know that COVID has changed many lives, and we ask that you may give them patience and that they continue to trust in you for the answers that they may seek. We thank you for all of those who have been faithful in their tithing, and we pray that it is used wisely so that others may come to know you through the work of St. Paul's. Friends, as we have heard from the scriptures and as we hear the words of Jesus, um, that whoever believes in him would have eternal life, we at this moment remember through a physical representation of the bread and of the wine that we remember Christ's sacrifice, that we have eternal life in Christ and that Christ is present with us in what we do here but also in the life that we live as we turn to him. And so these ordinary elements speak to us of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again that we may have life and life to the full with God. In celebrating the meal of the Lord's Supper, we celebrate the presence of the risen Christ among us at the center of our lives, at the center of our very being, at the heart of our community, at the heart of creation. And would you recognize in the actions of giving thanks, the receiving and giving of the bread and the wine, which is of the grace of God, and in the remembering and the participating. Um, this allows us uh, to come to God in worship and in sincerity. The Lord is with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. And so we give thanks to God our Father in this moment. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that even at this time of um, worshiping from home, that you are near to each of us where we are. Thank you that we can worship you. We acknowledge that it is because of you, Lord Jesus, that uh, in, in giving up your life, that we are free to come to you at any place and any hour. Thank you for this opportunity to share in and remember your grace toward us. Bless the elements which are before us in this sanctuary and in the various homes as we celebrate, that we may truly experience you, Lord Jesus Christ, present as we drink of the cup and eat of the bread. And we join together with the heavenly hosts as we proclaim together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the Lamb who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And trusting not in any goodness of our own, but only in your mercy, would we draw near to your table, believing with confident hearts in the great mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. For the sake of the offering made once and for all upon the cross, we ask you to grant us and all your people the fullness of your redeeming grace and love. And here we offer and present to you ourselves to be an acceptable, holy, and living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The scriptures teach us that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks for it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat this in remembrance of me. This is my body which is given for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed by my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, so we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again in glory. And so we pray together. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sin, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. And so friends, as you 
eat of the bread, would you share with one another the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for us? In the same way as you take up the cup, we share together the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ poured out for us. And so, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would you grant us grace and strength to love others as Christ has loved us here at your table. And grant us the blessing of your presence as we go from here as well, that we may be a light to the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Notices for this week are, next week, Stephen Crook will be doing a sermon for us. There is a Mancom meeting tomorrow night at 7. Council will also be meeting this week on the 18th. We're excited that we'll be opening our doors again and we'll be having one service at St. Paul's from the 21st of March. Please remember, you need to book your seat as we're still not allowed to be at full capacity. On the weekend of the 26th of March, we'll be having a potential minister joining us for the weekend. He will also preach at St. Paul's on the 28th. Please don't forget that youth is open again, so come and join on the fun every Friday night. Tonight at St. Paul's, we'll be having a prayer and worship evening led by Chris. Chris has offered his services to St. Paul's and you'll be seeing more of him. He'll be leading us in different sessions so that we can connect, pray, worship, and learn more about God. Please make sure you book your seat.
you all for joining us today. Let us do the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Have a good week, everyone.